This is the Unstarving Musicians Podcast. The podcast features conversation for musicians of all types and genres, a curation of expertise intended to help all musicians be better at marketing, business, the creative process, and all the other things that empower us to do more of what we love, make music. Greetings, friends, humans, musicians, and music lovers. This is Robonzo, a.k.a. Roberto. This episode of the Unstarving Musicians podcast features a conversation with award-winning producer, sound engineer, guitarist, vocalist, performer, and all-around cool guy, Kid Anderson. As owner of Greaseland Studios, Kid is doing some amazing work taking breaks to perform live in his current hometown of San Jose, California, and various locations abroad. He's also devoting time to help bring awareness to some otherwise lost gems of the blues world. This was my first in-person interview. It was really fun, yet a little nerve-wracking. Kid fortunately made it easy for me. Without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Kid Anderson. Kid, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Robert. So there's so much to talk about, but I wanted to talk about something that was, looks like a little bit of humor on your part. I was looking over some of your stuff and see that one of the titles you've listed yourself at is C-I-E-I-O <laughs> at Old McDonald's Farm. <laughs> and then also, maybe this was serious, um, I saw that uh, you worked at NASA at some point or another, so I wonder if you could talk about both of those things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, this all came from the other night when we were at Coco's Diner, me and the Aki Kumar, which is an artist I work with a lot, yeah. and the uh, waitress sat down and started talking to us, uh, actually for the whole duration we was there, about uh, how she had gotten this opportunity to take a class and became, become an intern at NASA, and I was like, you know, okay, from Coco's to NASA, that's great, uh, you know. Have you, you know, I was just wondering if she ever, like... Had any advanced math courses or anything? Yeah, (laughs) or, like, are you, like, a kid who grew up and wanted to be an astronaut? And she was like, no, but imagine how great it would look on Facebook that says I work at NASA. I was like, well, you don't have to go to school for that. (laughs) (laughs) I'll just change my title to boss at NASA right now. And and, uh, so, yeah, that's why I did that. And then she mentioned that her ex-husband was a CIO at somewhere and then I did not know of such a title before so that's how I came up with the title CIEIO at, 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 at Old McDonald's Farm <laughs> she, she clearly made an impression that's funny so the, we were talking earlier before we started here. Um, the first time we met was at a friend's. Uh, we were actually in a garage doing um, uh, our friend George Brando had pulled together some musicians to help his um, a relative of his celebrate a birthday. And I remembered being in there and you sitting down at the piano. I didn't know who you were at the time. And you're uh, uh, demonstrating some talent very quickly. I believe you played guitar later that night. And um, I also recall that we shared an interest, although I don't know, our interest may be different, but we had an interest, a past interest or current interest in the Rolling Stones because I'm just a huge fan and I like doing some singing and you told me that you played in a a tribute band. Yes, I noticed that. (laughs) That was was a a fun little garage party. Um, Yeah, I'm trying to remember exactly what we played, but but, yeah, I was... uh, Coincidentally, like you said, I was in the Rolling Stones tribute band when I was a young kid in Norway. Well, I was like 16 or something. Yeah. Actually, what what happened was that I went to a music school. I went to a high school. You know, the education system is a little different there. High school is kind of more like college uh, in Norway. So at that time, I went to a specialized music school with music classes, and I they gave me a guitar teacher. And uh, not to toot my own horn, but the guitar teacher they gave me, you know, um, I was already kind of more advanced than him. <laughs> and um, what could have been, I guess, kind of an awkward situation turned into something great because uh, he had a band and, and he hired me to play lead guitar in his band. And and one of the things we did was Rolling Stones tribute. <laughs> so that's... that's um, it actually, well, you know, I couldn't have had a better guitar teacher because he got me out in bars gigging when I was, you know, a young teenager. Ah, so that was the first time you were out playing then, huh? That was, um, 
No, I, st- I did my first gig right after I started playing, uh, you know, opening for some band at, at, a, at a movie theater when I was 11. And I played on TV. I played on this talent show on, on Norwegian TV when I was 13 and 14. Mm-hmm. And I actually made some money. But that, you know, the Rolling Stones tribute band, playing with them, that was my first foray into, you know, grown-up gigs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, playing it was for people drinking for a hundred bucks a night. Yeah, you know, nice. and I was like, "Whoa, this is great!" Yeah, you know, that was a lot of money to me at the time. You know, <laughs> well, I mean, I'm happy if I make a hundred bucks today when I play well, games. I right, I said, uh, you know, little did I know that's what you know people still will be making. Yeah, twenty years later, I know I've heard that talked about a lot. That and and I hadn't even thought about, it, but I was doing a gig with some guys or watching some guys play, and we were just talking about live music. And someone had reminded me, you know, in all the years that I've been playing or we've been playing, the pay really hasn't changed, When you know, when you're doing um, local club gigs and whatnot. I, you mentioned the school that you went to, and I, I really like asking or just, you know, talking a little bit about the education background of my guests because the reason I do it, the folks that I've had the pleasure of speaking with so far um, have uh, some pretty decent formal music education. Contrary to me, I had very little formal education. I'm a self-taught drummer, and more here now in my life in the past maybe three years, I've been um, diving into lessons and just realizing this whole world that's out in front of me. But a lot of you who've done accomplished so much in touring and recording and being engineers have a, a pretty interesting background. So do you have or make any correlation between the music education that you got in Norway and where you ended up in music? I mean, obviously, the guitar um, player was an influence, the teacher, but... Uh, well, that's, that's a good question. I'm not 100% on sold on uh, that. I mean, there's so many different kinds of great musicians. You know, I, I, I know guys who don't even know the notes, the names of the notes they're playing, mm-hmm. who, who are really great musicians. And I know guys who know a sh- shit ton, can I say that? Yes. Of, of, uh, of, <laughs> of, of theory and can, you know, pontificate and talk for days about, about uh, you know, even drummers, you, you can, like, you know, just know all this technical mumbo-jumbo and can explain everything they're doing for, you know, at l- length for <laughs> for hours and hours on face in Facebook threads but they can't actually keep a beat without slowing down uh, or or speeding up and I know guys with some guys I went to music school with I know there's a couple of people I knew who had perfect pitch like freakishly you know, just perfect pitch they could recognize the note you know a flat just like I can recognize the color red and they weren't any good. <laughs> Besides that, it was a circus trick. You know, they weren't any, you know, particularly good musicians. I don't know if there's like a, a, a you know, I don't believe there's necessarily, a, a, you know, a correlation between, you know, skill, education, talent, and, and all these things. Uh, but what I do know is that it doesn't hurt, you know. Sure. It doesn't hurt to have as much information and knowledge and skill, um and know how as as you possibly can. Sure. I mean, I do know that having a, a great ear, building up your ear is key. Yeah. You know, to to playing uh, anything really. Um, but I think you know you don't have to have you don't have to have perfect pitch because that's like a that's like a random freak thing in nature where where you know people are just born with it. It doesn't mean you can do anything with it, but you can build up you know your relative pitch. Yeah. And stuff like that. I mean, I don't know everything about music theory. I never did learn to read music really good. Well, good. (laughs) (coughs) Except either. Yeah. But, um, I mean, I can read music at a snail's pace. I can can write it. I I mean, if I have to, if I'm in a corner, you know, pushed up in a corner, I can give it a shot. Uh, But it's never something that came, that I spent a lot of time on, which is probably why I'm just not very good at it. But, you know, I know a modicum of, of music theory and stuff like that. And to me, it's it's helpful. You know, sure. I mean, it's helpful. I do a lot of, in my studio with other bands, I do a lot of, you know, I arrange horn charts. I arrange, uh, you know, even string parts sometimes and harmony vocals and all that, you know, stuff like that. It's, it's helpful to know, um, to know what you're doing, to know music, uh, just to know music in general. See, so... 
you know, otherwise people would be like, why does that sound wrong? And I goes, well, because you're saying an E chord, but there he's actually playing an E augmented and stuff like <laughs> yeah. that, you know? Yeah. And that's, it's a useful skill. Yeah. But, you know, but a lot of the best musicians just do this instinctively anyways. Yeah. You're like, you know, I've heard that, you know, many, many great, even great jazz musicians um, didn't, they didn't have a clue what they were doing. And definitely a lot of blues and, and rock musicians, you know, have no idea, you know, what, what they were doing. What they're playing, they just do it well, huh? Yeah, they just, they just, they just do it. They learn, you know, some other way. So um, you mentioned the importance of developing an ear for music. What does that mean to you? Well, it, it will, I mean, there's, there's several aspects to it. First, uh, the simplest, you know, the, the most basic thing is is that uh, air, basic air training where you can recognize pitches. And for a, for a musician, for a player, to have the skill to basically be able to, when you improvise, to play what you think. You know, you think something, boom, you can play it. And it's a direct translation. And, and that comes from air training. That's important. Another thing is to be, and I think, being a good listener is the most important part of playing music, especially with others. Yeah. I mean, my theory is that the more skill you have, the more you know what you're doing on the instrument and can do it, you know, in your sleep, the more brain capacity you can devote to actually listening to the other people. And that should be at least half of what your brain is doing is listening to the musicians uh, around you. And, um, uh, the other half is reacting to that, yeah. you know, with yeah, yeah. your uh, with your music. You know, that's that's two of the things about you know about training your ear that I think is important to being a a, a good sounding musician. I'm glad you um, mentioned listening to other musicians. I um, had written about it somewhat recently because it's uh, it just came to the realization that it's been a growing part of of my own playing and. All the guys that I admire constantly talk about it, um, making the other guys look good through listening to what they're doing. So, and I know a lot of guys are not fantastic at that, but anyway, that's good stuff. Um, yeah, I think a lot of it comes with uh, comes with skill level too. Hmm. You know, I mean, a lot of times this is you know, for example, this is a typical thing you'll hear in people whenever somebody gets to a uh, difficult passage or whatever, you mm-hmm. know, some part that they're not one hundred percent sure about and or or they're having difficulty execute, they will almost always rush. Even if they think the part is too fast, they'll play it faster than it needs to be because I think what happens is that the moment your brain is fully focused on just you and what you're doing, then you just block out the entire world and you block out the rest of the band and you just you're off to you know you're off to the races you stop listening to the song you stop listening to the groove and for a second you're just focused on what you're doing thusly you sound like crap you know even if you pull it off even if you play the right notes in the sequence you're supposed to you'd be like you know out of time with the band and and because even for just that you know split second you were just too wrapped up in what you were doing and you weren't listening and you weren't you're not listening then what are you doing yeah that is so interesting. Uh, certainly has happened to me as a drummer, you know, getting in my own head too much. Oh, well, yeah, you hear that drummers, they always speed up on their fills. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. But I observe it in, you know, bandmates a lot. Like you can just sort of look at body language and go, oh, they're not really listening to what's going on at the moment. So you just, you know, you try and help them out as much as possible. Well, what you do then is you play louder. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Volume compensates for a lot, especially as a drummer. Um, so when the other thing about when we first met, I... Um, after we first met, I went out and, and saw you play. You're amazingly talented guitar player. You're a great singer. You're entertaining and, and very entertaining. And I've never even seen you when you're dressed to the nines, either not in person. I've seen pictures, but I've seen you at some gigs where everybody's dressed pretty casual. And then um, I see pictures of some of the other work that you've done, and I'm like, wow, how how amazing you must be when you're in, in that particular role. So then later I learned that you're doing engineering and production of some records and I'm hearing about Greaseland Studios probably from our mutual friend George mm-hmm. and uh, I'm hearing a little little more and more what's coming out of the studio and then I hear that you've been nominated for some awards and yes. uh, you pick one or two up. So what I guess a couple of things or, or I'll start with you know what part of the Greaseland 
journey is has been the funnest for you in terms of the work that you've been doing here? See, I started doing my you know do my own recording and stuff. I was um, I guess I didn't necessarily set out to wanting to be an engineer or, or anything like that. But I always loved, you know, making records. And from when I was like, you know, in my late teens, I got in bands that would go and record, and I was totally in love with it. And and I got more into the inner workings of, you know, it just gets you more deeper into how music works and all the things you can do when you're recording. I mean, I was just, I was all over it. So I graduated to kind of being the producer for some people, bands I would play with. And um, I'd be the, you know, to be in the, like the communicator between the band, the musicians, and the engineer. Uh, because I would learn things, you know, I would learn how to get sounds that that I liked that weren't necessarily in your average engineer's vocabulary at the time. Uh, he's, you know, for instance, I love, love a lot of old blues records. I love, you know, rock and roll records. But I love stuff where stuff sounds dirty and gritty and, and distorted you know I like uh, like Muddy Waters records when you know he shouts and the vocal it overloads and distorted, distorts yeah. it goes in the red yeah. and of course that's like you know engineers been tearing their you know pulling their hair out of their heads for decades decades <laughs> trying to figure out how do we stop that from happening yeah. you know and you know they got that down pretty good they can record very cleanly now and, <laughs> and not have that problem but uh, now here you know here I am going. I want that sound, you know, because it's cool. It's it's. I mean, I think it's. I think it's a very human thing to like distortion. You know, it, 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 it's excitement. It's, uh, you know. So I would. So I would. I would learn stuff like, hey, crank that microphone preamp up and and, and make it. You know, go in the red. Go, Who's going in the red? I go. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, then after a while, you know working with different engineers and stuff, you know, I started realizing a few things, you know, it's like one thing, it was, it got to be pretty draining for me to like, always have to fight with these guys over, over the sounds that I wanted. When you were being recorded. When I was being recorded or when I was producing for somebody else, yeah. And, uh, and then I also realized that, wait a minute, this, you know, these guys charge by the hour, most of them. It goes, the slower they work, the less efficient they are, the more money they make. Mm-hmm. And I go, that's not right. So, so I, you know, I started dabbling in it myself. Yeah. And, you know, that's what eventually led to me, you know, to become an engineer. And, and, and um, but since coming from it, from that side, I always, you know, the studio, everything in the studio, to me, it's, it's, there, it's a musical instrument. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's not. I don't know anything about capacitors and resistors, and you know. I mean, if stuff starts smoking, I I, I call someone. <laughs> you know? But uh, so you know, the word engineer is thrown around pretty loosely these days. But I know how to operate my studio. You know, so um, that's yeah, that's how I got into that. Yeah, very cool. So. As far as performing, are you still doing your thing with the Nightcats? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, still playing with Rick Estrin and the Nightcats. Uh, we just got a, a great new drummer from Norway. Did you? Uh, yeah. He's actually moving in here uh, after our tour of Europe at the end of this month. And, um, yeah, we got a new record coming out on Alligator Records. And Is this yeah. going to be the fifth for you or the band? You have four re- albums, yes? With the Nightcats? Well, I saw four bodies of work when I was looking over some things that I didn't know about you. So I didn't. As yeah, I'm I, asking you, I'm realizing yeah, I, I don't know if it's with the Nightcats or if some of it's yours, some of it is. Uh, oh, me Nightcats. personally, I probably have like four, four or five solo records out of different sorts. I haven't made one in, in quite a while, but uh, this will be our my fourth record with the Nightcats. Yeah, cool. I- anything yeah. in particular that is different or exciting for you about the one that's coming out? Well, well, it, well we got a new drummer. Yeah. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> that is important in my book. It's exciting anyway. Not important, but exciting. I um, I like the drummer you guys had, so anyway. Look no, Jay was here. great, but uh, the, this guy, Alex, uh, who's a, he's actually a guy I know, I know him since, since I was like 
18 or 19 and lived in Norway. And this guy was 15 or 16, and he was an up-and-coming blues drummer and just incredibly talented. And I played with him a lot over there. And actually, for the first few years after I moved here to America, I was trying to get every drummer I played with, I was trying to get him to sound like him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now he's, you know, now he's in his 30s, and he's really great. And, um, oh, nice. And um, he was actually kind of saying to me that you know he was looking for a way to uh, uh he's you know he was kind of hinting that hey you know what i kind of want to go to america and just you know see what i can do he's unattached and and uh, he'd done every gig he could in norway you know and played with you know everybody across the board so this opening came up yeah so to speak and i go hey i know the guy so uh, yeah he's coming here in june and he's coming to the greaseland hotel that's right. <laughs> but he already did come in February. Yeah. He already come, came for a, a couple of weeks, and we recorded a new album. Sweet. Which was, yeah, that was a lot of fun for me. How nice. And so, your new drummer coming here from Norway, and, and that he wanted to do that made me think of, you know, this area is a blues scene. He's obviously attracted to something about it. Maybe a lot has to do with you. But it got me thinking about other blues scenes around uh, the U.S. And so I wanted to ask you, because I'm, I'm not... So I'm familiar with, you know, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Silicon Valley, as far as what they offer in the area of blues. What areas of the country, I don't know, in the past 10 years, 15 years, have you found particularly interesting as far as the blues scene goes? Hmm, well, there's... I mean, there's, there's a lot of good little blues hotbeds uh right around around different places uh, there's uh in southern california there's you know around long beach and, and in san diego there's, there's a lot of great players and you know what you need i mean you need two things basically well three things you need like you need the musicians you need the venues and you need an audience yeah <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> and and um you know, it's hard to find, you know, a lot of all three. But, you know, obviously you got a place like Austin, which mm-hmm. is still, you know, really happening for for music. And, um, I mean, there's there's a lot of places around um, around the U.S. You know, Atlanta had a really pretty happening scene for uh, Florida. There's a lot of great players in Florida. Oh, nice. uh, but right now, I think, I mean, I think this is it as far as the most, you know, alive, kind of hopping. Right here in Silicon Valley. Yeah, right here, yeah. That's cool. South, and then the deep south bay, as I call it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. It sounds more romantic that way. Yeah. So um, I want to switch gears and ask you about something I just learned of uh, this week through our mutual friend, George, who I keep bringing up. But um, well, I love George. He's a fine specimen of humanity. <laughs> he is. I was just telling him this morning because he was telling me a little story. I was telling him he's a bit of a rock for a lot of people, and he didn't. I don't think he realizes it. So I wanted to ask you about the foundation that was started with yourself and Jim Pugh. Can you talk a little bit about that? And what oh yes, you know? I'd love to. It was Jim Pugh. You know, he's the, he's the founder of the uh, the Little Village Foundation, which is a a nonprofit organization. Its uh, purpose is basically to uh, uh, well, you know, they, they call it like uh, promoting. Diversity through the commonality of music. Well, I, mean, I forgot the slogan, I'm afraid. But, uh, <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> you know they're doing some good things. Yeah, yeah, they're doing some good things. Basically, what Jim started out doing was to um, to do, a, it's like a record label in that we make music. We find artists that a normal, re- you know, a profit-based record label wouldn't be interested in because... I mean, hey, there ain't no money to be made on popular music. Yeah. So, <laughs> Much less going out and find guys who don't have a career at the moment, but are really talented, right? Yeah, exactly. It's it's, it's that kind of thing. And and he's, uh, you know, the first year he he um, he produced uh, uh, some of the things he did. You know, it wasn't just blues records. He did a he did um he recorded a CD of this cowboy, some guy from the from the you know from the middle of California who's a just straight up cowboy. I mean, he's like a rodeo, um, like a real genuine, not a rodeo clown, but, but he's a, <laughs> a genuine cowboy, huh? A, 
That's a cell phone for those of you who are listening and wondering <laughs> if we're in some <laughs> sort of trouble. <laughs> I'm going to turn this ham alarm on. I didn't. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Okay. Yeah, so what, he, he recorded a, a cowboy who was, you know, singing cowboy songs that he'd made up and uh, telling stories. Mm -hmm. I forget if he recorded around a campfire or not. I think he might have actually gone into a facility. Wow. Uh, but, um, and this other group, which was a group of these migrant farm workers uh, called Mixtech, which these guys don't speak English and they don't speak Spanish. They speak some kind of hybrid uh, that nobody understands, and they had to have an interpreter, and they're farm workers from cent the central California, wow. and they have their whole completely own culture. And part of that is music. So he recorded these these three guys uh, who were playing this kind of music, and so he does you know does diverse stuff like that. But we've done a lot together because Jim Pugh is a, you know he's a great keyboard player, and he's from you know same kind of background as me. It, you know he's a blues and and soul and and R and B. He played with Robert Cray for twenty five years and Edda James. For like ten years before that, and he's played with Otis Rush, and and uh, I mean you name him, you know John Lee Hooker, and BB King, and um, anyways, um, we did a record uh, with a guy named Wee Willie Walker, mm -hmm. and he was this Rick and I, uh, Rick Estrin and myself met this old soul singer who was doing a crappy happy hour show at a bar, dive bar, next to where me and Rick were playing in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. We played there, and, and next door to where we were playing, Rick knew this chick who um, who said, hey, you guys should go check out my friend Willie. And we go over there, and um, and this guy is, you know, he's he's a he's an older black guy. He does not look that old, though. He's very young and, and tiny. And... Um, and Rick hears uh, him singing, and, uh, and, and and you know the guy's unbelievable, and um, and uh, we find out his name is Willie Walker. And I turn out Rick had some forty fives by a Willie Walker that came out on Gold Wax Records, um, and some on Chess wow. from the from the late sixties. Wow. Turns out it's the same guy. Oh my goodness! He's just been living in Minnesota, doing you know the occasional local gig, and mainly just working at a factory. And that's what he's been doing since, like, 1969. Wow. So we started talking to him, and we decided we are going to produce a record with him. And we flew him out to California, and we put together a band, and we did all this, you know, just of our own volition. There was no uh, no record label, and nobody had any money. Um, but we just, uh, you know, got together to make this record, and... and uh, and we called Jim Pugh to, to come and do the record and be the keyboard player. Because I know, you know, A, he would be the like the best musician for it. And B, he would, um, you know, he would be into doing it. You know, it would be right up his, uh, right up his alley as far as a, a yeah. worthwhile project. And while we were doing this, he starts telling me about this idea he has for a non-profit organization, which was the Little Village Foundation. Mm -hmm. So that... Ideas started kind of developing or, or coming to, coming into the world as we were doing this. So that became like the first little village project, uh, project wow. release. Yeah, after we had recorded it and, and stuff, and that gave him a, a great kickstart for that, and and gave us a platform for Willie's record too, and it worked out for everybody. Wow. And what did Walker think about it when you when you were all like, "Hey, we want to bring you to California." He was he was all for it. I mean, he was. Uh, I mean, well, Willie's a very he's an extremely agreeable fella. Yeah, he's uh, so he's like sure I can hang with you. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's like he, he says you know he says yes to everything that doesn't sound all to you know altogether objectionable. So uh, yeah, we'd actually we actually found out. Uh, you know, part of the story too. We we play these blues cruises sometimes mm -hmm. with Rick and. Um, and uh, you know, they're a big deal. There's a lot of bands on there and stuff, and they have a lot of jams on there. It turns out Willie and his wife had been going on these cruises. Oh my goodness! So have you had you as a passenger? Oh my goodness! <laughs> as a paying passenger, 
And he couldn't even like get any respect at the at the open mic at like the amateur jam. They they you know, nobody I mean he was better like by far better than anyone on a better singer, better artist than anyone on the on Blues the Cruise. <laughs> and he's getting like the brush off at the amateur jam up you know, upstairs at the crow's nest. <laughs> wow. That was unbelievable. Wow. You know. So we went on a cruise after that with Willie and at that point, we just said, well, if they're not going to give you a gig, we'll, we'll make a gig. So we just started putting together shows with him. And whatever bar on the cruise was, like, not being used, we just set up there and played. <laughs> and, and, and we drew, you know, packed houses every night. How cool. So now, and now he's nominated for several uh, Blues Music Awards. That's so great. What has um, all that work, what you guys have done so far with the foundation... I'm assuming that there's a lot of goodwill that comes from it, and just a lot of men that felt good to do that, and what a great record. Are there any? Are there things that are unexpected that have come from it that have indirectly affected you or Greaseland or some of the artists that have come in contact with you, perhaps through the foundation? Or well, yeah. Repeat that question one more time. Yeah. I was kind of spa- <laughs> I was kind of spacing out. You know, I was just wondering if. The work that you guys have done at the foundation, outside of what I'm assuming, you know, some things that obviously would come out of it, like goodwill that you've created with the community, these musicians that haven't done something like that in a really long time, or maybe never, and just making, you know, just feeling good about what you've done, feeling good about putting together a great record, seeing some smile on some people's faces. I'm just kind of curious, what else has possibly come out of it that you didn't expect? And the reason I ask, maybe this will help, the reason I ask, you know, it's a foundation. You're volunteering a lot of time and resources to make the projects happen. Um, and, you know, I think some people, everybody understands, uh, well, a lot of people get the value of, of volunteering or doing things like that. But I think that when people like yourself get involved, you know, in projects like that, there are these other things that come out that you and Jim recognize that maybe you didn't realize were going to happen and that sort of speak to the greatness of you know, volunteering or starting a foundation. So again, the question is like, have there things that come out, came out of it or have come out of it that you didn't expect that have been really nice? Oh, yeah. Well, yes, yeah, so some of the greatest things uh, for me have come out of it. I mean, for one thing, we've gotten a lot of uh, work, gigs, with stuff that started in the Little Village Foundation. And did that take you by surprise? That those things happened? Or you no, okay. I'm not, I wasn't, surprised by that I was kind of expecting that because we're putting out you know quality stuff yeah. uh, but Jim and the foundation's uh, you know efforts because they you know what they do basically uh, if an artist gets you know picked to be a, 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 a one of the little village people <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like with Willie what, what the foundation does is that they uh, cover the cost of you know making a CD we print up a thousand CDs which we give to the artists. I mean, Little Village doesn't own any intellectual property. So it's just made, just a thing to, you know, to help the artists. So we make, you know, make the record, print it up, give a thousand copies to the artists, and then we send out like 250 CDs or something. And we also do promo for that CD so to give this, you know, the artist a, a boost. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Some things that have come out of that, like it's like we played the Noton Blues Festival in Norway. Uh, we actually got in several overseas and some big festivals here in America that have hired like a Little Village Foundation review. Nice. Um, we played the Hardly Strictly Bluegrass Festival. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's good. With, uh, with Willie and with John Blues Boyd, who's another great blues singer. He's actually somebody that I kind of brought to the Little Village Foundation because... He's just, I'll get back to him in a second. But, um, yeah, that's one thing that's come from it is, you know, gigs. We've gotten, you know, we've gotten gigs with these, a lot of these artists that we've uh, produced. And, of course, you know, when something good comes out there, other people hear it. And then, you know, I've probably gotten a lot of work on the legs of the Willie Walker record because it's a really great record. Is that the one titled Remembering Little Walker? No, totally no, it's not. Project. What's no, the name not. of the album? It's called If Nothing Ever Changes. Thank you. By Wee Willie Walker. 
if nothing ever changes, I got. And we try. also now have we also recorded that uh, the live show we did in Norway with Willie Walker. We also recorded that and put that out on Little Village Foundation as well. Cool. That's very cool. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. We're getting close to the hour. Um, I should probably ask you something that I mentioned before we got started, that my goal is to help other musicians learn from people that are doing such wonderful things like yourself. Yeah, lead the way. Yeah, so I want to talk just for a second about business, and then if we have enough time, just sort of like, you know, what's what's your big advice to anyone who wants to do certain things? But So I would have to think that along the way of all of your work, um, between recording and touring and helping other artists that you've acquired some business skills along the way. I don't know how much you think about them or if they're a huge part of your, like your operation here at Greaseland, for instance, but can you speak to any skills that you picked up along the way that have been invaluable to you as far as business is concerned? And are there, some, you know, are these the same ones that you wish you would have learned earlier on? That's a good broad question. I'm not, I'm not a good businessman. I have about a couple hundred bucks in my checking account. <laughs> but, but I probably got like a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of guitars. But, uh, you know, the business part of it is uh, tricky, I guess, in a way. Um, you know, there's one thing. I mean, well, you need good gear. It helps, at least, to have good gear right. to make good music. Now, the thing for me is that what I'm doing is what I want to do with my life. I don't, you know, I'm not like some people probably are where they like, they can't wait to get done working so they can do what they want to do with their day. I'm not like that. When I'm making music and working in the studio, I am doing what I want to do with my life. Um, so, um, you know, if I see a, a microphone or a guitar or something, I think will improve my work. I don't have that feeling of, Oh, you know, I really should get this microphone, but what I really want is a hot tub. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's so it's an easy choice. For it's you. an easy choice for me. <laughs> so, uh, so that you know, there's that side of the business. I mean, it was basically, you know, it's like you got to you got to spend money to make money, and and then you know, but then there's also you know uh, dealing with people and money because you know you got to you got to get paid. Sure. It's. Uh, I mean, I hate having. I still hate having those discussions. I hate. Really? Yeah, I, I really hate talking about money, especially with people who are already friends. You know, <laughs> and and uh, you know, most the way things work in this business is that you get work based on you know who you know. You know, it's it's uh, a lot of people come to me recording are people I know just from being a musician, and I know them from playing, and I know them from gigs or I know from hanging back backstage at a music festival and you already have a personal rapport and it's very tricky it's hard for me to make that to have those discussions to have and those discussions and, and and ask for for money you know I mean if it's a complete stranger sending me you know you know hey I want to go in your studio to record, you know, I can, you know, I can write, okay, this is how much I want, you know, if it's, if I don't know him from Adam, yeah. but usually, you know, a lot of these people, you're kind of close to them. I, yeah, <laughs> I know a lot of these people, I'm kind of close to them. And plus, you know, it's already, you know, well documented that, that some people like, uh, like we Willie Walker or this guy, John blues Boyd, who I've been working with forever. They're kind of like guys that I, you know, discovered or whatever. And I wanted to make records with them for my own personal gratification and because I thought it was important. And basically, I'm doing it, I'm doing it for free, out of my own pocket. Sure. You know, and it's it's just a lot of weird, it's a lot of potential for awkwardness. Sure. That, that somebody, you know, for somebody I know, it goes, well, I mean, you recorded Willie Walker for free. Why, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I haven't really gotten that. Uh, conversation a lot. You oh, know. That's interesting. I, I haven't gotten I haven't gotten that a lot, but but I'm always afraid of it. But but you know, hey, you know what's a damn good powerful word to use is no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm trying to learn how to use my time so that I, I minimize the amount of time wasted. I minimize the amount of time where I'm just appeasing somebody else. You know, if I'm doing something, it's got yeah, it's, it's got to be something in it for me 
And because, you know, otherwise you're going to be stressed too thin and you're going to be uh, um, stressed out and angry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And nobody wants that. I really appreciate you sharing that aspect of the business. I am re- you know, recalling that for the Unstarving Musician project many months back, I um, spoke with and sent out emails to a lot of musicians to ask, you know, what was the number one biggest thing that you feel like is basically an obstacle or makes it difficult for you to get your music out there? whether you're just trying to gig or, or do music. And um, money came up a fair amount. And I'm someone, I'm not, you know, I'm not a highly paid musician. I play very part-time. I, I'm okay having the conversations, and I've learned how to do it. But um, you bringing it up the way that you did has made me realize that's something that we could talk about in future shows, uh, not necessarily you and me, but um, that I could talk about with some people on future shows because I think um, it's one of the things people would like to learn how to sort of navigate and not feel whatever, you know, any awkwardness, like you said, so, anyway. Yeah, for bringing it no, up. It's, it's, it's really, it's really hard to, uh, to not feel that awkward, you know, to, I mean, I got my assistant, who's doing recording of his own now, too, you know, Robbie, mm-hmm. he's, a, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's learning, you know, mm-hmm. he's trying, and he's just as awkward as me, or maybe even more, asking for money. About having those, yeah. You know, he always comes to me, and goes, how much should I ask for, you know, how, <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> Do you guys charge, um, I don't even know what's common these days, because uh, I don't record a lot. Um, I'm not comfortable but, talking about that. But <laughs> <laughs> but do, do you guys charge by the hour or by the project these days mostly? Or do you, what do you, you know? Well, you know, it depends. Okay. I mean, I tailor everything. Okay. You know, I mean, it, it just as I go along yeah, yeah. to see what I think <laughs> will work the yeah. best yeah, yeah, yeah. you know I mean I've, I've there's so many factors that play in for me you know for me personally yeah. I like to uh, usually what I do is I have a, I have a day rate you know mm-hmm. I have you know a day rate of, of like uh, you know it could be like 750 bucks and, and you know we could work for you know however long it might be 10 hours and, and I'll do everything you know play whatever I engineer makes whatever's you know whatever's needed mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's an example of, of, of a rate. And, but then, you know, sometimes I can do it on an hourly rate, if, d- d- depending on what the nature is. I mean, if somebody, if somebody's, you know, has got a full band and goes, oh, we got a 10-piece band, you know, um, we want to record some stuff, how much, you know, I'm not going to charge that by the hour because that's going to be a day. Yeah. You know, if you're recording one song or an album, that's, that's going to be, you know, at least a day to yeah. set up and, and, and get all that going. If somebody's going to come in and do a, a, a voiceover, you know, on a commercial or something, it's obviously not going to be a whole day. So, um, you know, I, I, I tailor it to that. And, and uh, I mean, and I worked with a, you know, I worked with a band the other day uh, and I'm still working with. Uh, it was a project I really wanted to do because they're a big name in, in blues and, and, um, and blues rock. You know, I worked out a deal with them at first, which was um, a daily rate. Mm-hmm. And then they weren't really that prepared, but we were, you know, working out a lot of the stuff together. And I was being the producer, and we were working out, and we were like recording like maybe one, two songs a day. And I mean, they had a budget, but after a while, I could sense that, you know, the leader of the band was starting to get a little antsy about the fact that, you know, the clock was ticking. Yeah. You know, so at some point, I just said, you know, after today, we'll just end the daily rate, we'll just call it one set some to complete the album however much it is um, because that way you can relax you know because you're going to make better music when you're relaxed yeah then you don't have to to worry about it and um did that work out okay for both of you guys the band we're still working on it <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure it's going to work out great i'm sure i'm sure it'll be fine because you yeah. know that's again that's something i want to do and, and people i i know and enjoy working with you know yeah there's been yeah, there's every situation is is different, you know. When you do it, well, if you run a studio and you're an engineer, you're like as much as egos and psychologicals. That's yeah. Rick Astry calls it. <laughs> that's that's uh, egos and psychologicals. That's, that's that's a big part. I mean, you're you're not just you know you know it's not just about you know getting the gain levels right and you know stuff like that. Recording stuff, what microphone to use? It's it's more about you know something. You got to be a mediator. You got to be a <laughs> You got to be like a, a a shrink. You got to be, you know. People come in and they start, you know, crying about stuff. I mean, you know, it's sometimes I've had people come in and just sit here and talk all day when, when you were planning to record. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's amazing. As soon as you started going down that 
thread of the conversation, I'm thinking, okay, so you're a therapist and yeah, <laughs> you're a therapist. You're like every, whatever, whatever you need. Yeah. So, um, we're about at the hour. I did want to ask you one last thing if you have a minute and, sure. um, and that is for up and coming artists or want to be up and coming artists who have our collecting, um, a decent catalog of original material who probably both want to record and maybe they want to get out and tour times are obviously changing very rapidly on the music scene what do you have any you know advice for people right now who are maybe trying to get an album done or you know they want to get their music out there what what comes to well i have advice for up and coming people who want to break into you know doing well any kind of work but particularly you know being a musician or being a producer or engineer i think the secret to success is very simple it's not, you know, it's not complicated like you need, you know, like go to this website and, and you got to network with these people. For, it's, to me, it, it seems simple. There's two things you got to do. Well, one thing you got to do, one thing you got to don't. And <laughs> be really good, you know, really kick ass. And two, don't be an asshole. <laughs> You know, to try and minimize it anyways, you know. I used almost the exact same words in writing about this. I'm glad to hear you say it. I think that most people would agree. Although I haven't heard as many people talk. Oh, well, one of my friends, a good friends, had said, you really need to write some great stuff. You said it. You know, you got to be really good. I had sort of put it out there myself as, you know, be good at your craft. Get good at your craft. Always work yeah. on it. And just be a nice person, as George says. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So. You know, people come to me and he goes... Man, you, you, you know, you're getting all the awards and stuff, and you know, where's my awards? And I go, well, you're not very good, and you're kind of a whiny bitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, man, thank you so much. I guess I broke um, my second rule there. That's all right. <laughs> it's all right. Um, thank you so much for um, giving me some time out of, out of your day. I had so much more I wanted to ask you about, so maybe yeah, we can go do ahead. it again sometime in the future. More, ask me some more questions if you get them. That's all right. <laughs> well, okay, if you have a minute, that would yeah. be cool. I always sort of envisioned, although I'm kind of learning differently, and it may be because we're, I tend to you know, talk to people that are aging like myself. Although you're much younger than me. But Everyone's aging. I know, that's right. <laughs> um, but I'm always curious with musicians, especially when they've been doing what you've done for so long, or they've been touring for so long, or maybe they've you know reached just crazy levels of celebrity, but uh, about the lifestyle. So, And it's really simple, actually. I'm doing this big build-up, but I'm kind of curious. Are you more of a night person, or a you know, night owl, or are you a morning person? Is it really dictated by the work? What? I'm definitely not a morning person. I, mean, I like the middle of the day. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> by the middle of the day, I mean like from two and on. And I work. I, I work a lot at night. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not a morning person at all. I, mean, I used to. Uh, you know, I, mean, I used to stay up all night. You know, getting high and, and partying and stuff. But I don't do that anymore. But I still. I stay up late. I was probably up till about three last night. Oh my goodness! Well, I did come from a. I forget, what the hell did I do last night? See, not much has changed. <laughs> <laughs> what about, um, I'm going to switch gears, something I did want to ask you about. You talked a little bit about your early days in music in Norway, and I was just kind of curious what it was like for you growing up, and, and can you say the name of the town where you grew up? Uh, yes, I can say it. <laughs> Good luck repeating it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's The town, is a, what disclaimer, is that most people in Norway don't even know about this town. It's a small, it's a small village, and the name of it is Herre, that's spelled H-E-R-R-E. That's a very small place, and they used to have a paper factory there. What was the second part of the question? Yeah, I was just kind of curious about what it was like growing up there, and, and thank you for pronouncing it, because I saw it, and it, it looks fairly simple, written different than what you just described on, like, Wikipedia or whatever, but... I'm like, I'm going to mispronounce it. But, yeah, what was it like yeah, growing every, up there? everybody mispronounces it. They don't even pronounce it right in Norway. Um... <laughs> What was it like growing up there? Oh, it was ideal, really. You know, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a good thing to grow up in a small town. Uh, you kind of have to get to know everybody. You know, you learn about people. You learn to get along with people. And I think, you know, I think it's it's good for growing up. I was, I felt a little bit stifled uh, because it's such a small place, and I'm kind of a dreamer and and, and an adventurer. You know, it's it's it has, it's a small town and has a small town mentality, mm-hmm. which is, you know, if you kind of start 
doing something remarkable or making something out of yourself that it's kind of it's not just met with praise and it's more and, special maybe it's no it's it's kind of frowned upon really yeah no oh, wow. it's that's that kind of you know small town mentality which you find in a lot of places in norway mm-hmm. and you know i i didn't like that i was you know when i was you know 13 or something i was on a nationally televised talent show and you know made a big splash for, you know for for a split second I mean, it felt like a huge deal at the time and just the general feeling is that you know they don't they didn't really want like the notoriety on the, the town or yeah the, no they did not no they just didn't like for anybody to to stick out too much <laughs> you know it's it's uh, to me the the norwegian mentality in many places is kind of stifled it's it's kind of they want to keep you humble to a fault you know, yeah. I think, and so I couldn't wait to get out of there. What and what got and, you? Uh, what brought you to America? Well, I mean, I, I from you know from when I was a kid, I was I was just like this you know total dreamer type, and and I would, uh, I mean, there was a factory across the fjord from where I grew up, and I didn't even know it was a factory. All I knew was that at night I could see all these lights, and it looked really exciting. Uh, it looked like just some other world, you know. I just imagined this, you know, town like a like a forties gangster movie in an alleyway, you know, which was it was a fucking it was a it was a PVC factory. They made plastic pellets, but that, that's not the <laughs> that's what it really was. But but when I you know when I found when I discovered blues and American music, and I suppose particularly blues, particularly old Chicago blues, I would just. I would listen to that, and it would just transport me, you know, to this other mysterious world that was not the world I was used to, because the world I was used to was very safe and stifling and, you know, confining and boring and nice, but just not, it wasn't, you know, it didn't quench the, you know, thirst that was in my soul that, yeah. that for some other, you know, adventure, which I think is, I, I, mean, I think, you know, we used to be like that, you know, thousand, two thousand years ago. <laughs> the Vikings and stuff, they were, you know, they were totally like that. A little adventurous. Blood. Yeah, <laughs> a little more adventurous, you know. But the, the culture I'm, I was from, I was like, even, you would, you would kind of get looks. If you got an A on a test, people would actually kind of give you, oh, who do you think you are? Pace yourself, man. Yeah. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> so, I mean, you know, for some, some my age, I mean, I was like, you know, this guitar player which and i was on tv when i was 13 and there were people was like the other kids anyway you know were like oh i guess you think you're hot shit <laughs> you know <laughs> wow. and, so that's you know spite has been a you know somebody asked rick Esterin one time they said they said what made you want to get so good on a harmonica and rick said well he goes, I wanted to get so good that all the kids I went to school with would kiss my ass, would want to kiss my ass, and then I'd tell them all to fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, switching gears again, I'm interested in, and I think young players are interested in, the different trends that are happening in music with things ranging from distribution of their music or where they can make money that musicians hadn't in the past have you seen anything interesting and in, um, trend-wise that may, maybe it has something to do with? It probably does have something to do with technology, but any trends that are sort of catching your attention in the way people are getting music out there or doing some facet of making their music? I mean, the only trend I'm seeing is you know death. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, I'm just you know, yeah, man, I'm just lucky that people still want to make records. You know, that's what I mean. I don't. I was like, that ain't my department, man. I don't know how to make money off of music other than how I do it. I mean, there's still people who, like, put on shows, pay a ticket for a show, mm-hmm. and when they're at this show, I'm going to buy a CD to have an excuse to come up and talk to you. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I do gigs. I make records. That's that's really all I know about, you know. So then I'll sort of ask kind of stay along the same line and maybe ask a different question that's somewhat related but like for you and being able to continue doing what you're doing because I'd like to bring other people on the podcast in the future that you know share stuff that 
and someone even like yourself would go, hey, that's pretty cool. I should try that. Is that are any of these trends that you maybe know are out there for you know getting music out there, getting you know the things that are happening after recording the record, are those kind of things of interest to you? Um, yeah, I have a modicum of interest in it, but like uh, that's yeah, that's what I tell everybody. I goes, that's not my department. Yeah. So you're just in, yeah. yeah, you're just so wrapped up in the love of what you're doing. Yeah, so I, okay. I, I I I I don't want to know what's going on out there. That's yeah. just depressing. Man. <laughs> I live here in a cocoon and pretend like it's 1972, <laughs> but with computers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like it. The um, you gave me a quick tour when I walked in, and it's a pretty amazing place for those of you who are just listening. And um, there's all kinds of instruments and gear and albums, lots of albums. I'm envious. I uh, when we moved out of the country, my wife and I purged what few albums I had left, but um, oh. it looks like a great collection. So, a gear question. Yeah. What's your latest and greatest, most favorite gear that you've come across, either for the studio or just like for playing? Oh well, hell. I just had a friend uh, gift me, well, lend lend me, like one of those indefinite lens. Yeah. A 1965 LA-2A Teletronics compressor, which is like a five dollars $6,000 unit that he'd had in storage since 2002. And I just got that up and running. So I'm pretty stoked about that. What, you is, know. that, what is that piece of gear going to enable you to do that you... What's uh, what's exciting about Say it? Say I have one of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to use it on the current project or maybe later? Uh, yeah, I'll probably I'll probably use it on, you know, somebody playing the bass if they're playing real uneven or something. I don't know. It's going to be a... It's cool It's going to be a pretty, pretty minuscule amount of difference to the overall thing. But it excites me. Yeah, that's cool. And Do you ever... I kind of have a guess for the answer, but do you ever, you know, your days and evenings or your life's consumed with music, you love it, but do you have times of the day or the week or the month where you have to escape music a little bit just to sort of recharge or anything, or is it just like, nope, keep it coming? No, I like, uh, you know, I like going to bed at night and, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and laying with my wife and, and watching TV yeah. with our cats. Yeah. Cool. That's that's I mean that's that's Escape plenty. enough and you're ready to go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, I've kind of wondered about this. I and I probably asked because um, a lot of recent years for me have been you know learning material for gigs and I'm constantly trying to go back to it because I wanted you know what was I missing before or or it's something new and just time consuming and and sometimes I I have found in more recent years I have to just shut it off for a little while and you know, not listen and I guess for me it's kind of recharging but I'm just kind of curious about the musicians. No, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I like. I don't mind stopping working sometimes, but you yeah. know, I mean, I'll just sit down, you know, right in the chair where you're sitting, and put on some records, and you know, I don't, I don't really get tired of music. Yeah. You know, I get tired of one particular song. Yeah. <laughs> There's so much out there, right, to keep discovering whether it's new or old. So, I guess, lastly, what do you do? Because you, you're still gigging a lot, right? Oh yeah, yeah. And, and touring outside of the area. Yes. So what do you do to, and it may just, you may tell me that it's, you know, the music does all that for me, but are you, what do you do to sort of stay uh, fit and happy when you're doing a lot of moving around and maybe long hours, you got to travel a lot? Do I look fit to you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my question really is like, you know, it might be, I don't necessarily mean just physically, but like just keeping your your attitude and your staying happy and feeling lifted and being able to go on stage physically and do what you do and have a good time and do it again and again and again. Is there, well, you know, it helps if they have stairs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, uh, not having to get a real job does all that for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it is the music itself. For the yeah. Answer, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's, yeah, man, as long as I can stay out of the labor pool, I'm, I'm happy, man. Cause I wouldn't do very good in there. So what's the next next project that you maybe want to tell people about? What's on the right? You've, the album maybe, but uh, well, we're right now I'm working with these two Brazilian guys. Two guys came in from Brazil and they're making a record with with me and you know some local musicians here, and um, that's the next thing I'm doing. And then I'm going tomorrow. I'm going to the to Memphis for the Blues Music Awards. Uh-oh. And, and they get you up for anything again? Yeah, yeah. I'm nominated for Guitar Player of the Year. Sweet. And I was there's like uh, another seven awards that I have a personal interest in because I either produced their record mm-hmm. or... No, that's why, yeah. <laughs> you say you're doing that tomorrow? You're leaving tomorrow? I'm leaving tomorrow, yeah. 
Well, congratulations. Um, have a great time. Sounds like a great note to wrap up on. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have to follow up with you to see how things went and how much fun you had there and what you got to see your friends do. I mean, you're probably going to come home with some uh, trophies. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> well, man, um, keep doing what you're doing. Thanks very much for your time, buddy. Hey, man. Right. Good seeing it. Yeah, the bl- pleasure was mine. I got to wash these slippers, man. They just fucking smell. <laughs> Hey, this is Robonzo. Thanks so much for listening. Did you know I'm also an author? Check out my book, The Unstarving Musician's Guide to Getting Paid Gigs, How to Get Booked and Paid What You're Worth Over and Over Again, available on Amazon. And the book is also available in audio format as The Unstarving Musician's Guide podcast. Check it out wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Last but not least, are you a gigging musician, recording artist, songwriter, or touring professional? Perhaps struggling to get your music out to the world? Struggling to get the gigs you want? Pop over to unstarvingmusician.com and sign up for my email list. I'll send you an occasional email with tips, expert advice, music, musician resources, and anything else I come across that might make your journey better and brighter. With much gratitude, peace, love, and more cowbell. Cowbell.